The following interview was conducted with Francis Cordova, the president of Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on, place on Tuesday, November 6, 2007, at her office in Hufty Hall. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about you, where Catherine. you were born and your parents and early lives and schooling. I was born in Paris, France, and um, my my father had just graduated from West Point and married my mother. and. He went overseas as chief of missions for care that helped in the American reconstruction in Europe after the Second World War. And I didn't spend much time in France, just a few weeks, and then we moved to Germany where three of my siblings were born. And I lived there till I was about six, and then we decided as a family to make the move to California, and Dad would start his own business there with a uh, partner from care. And so I really consider myself a um, Southern California girl. Oh, sounds good. Where do, do you have uh, siblings, brothers, and sisters? How many children in the family? There are 12 children, and it's not cheaper by the dozen. Uh, we, I'm the oldest, and um, they're all just uh, alive, and it's a very big, happy family. We get together frequently. My parents are alive, too, so yeah. that's just Do they great. also live in, still live in California? They do. Okay, that's right. And it, where'd you go to your early schooling then was was in California as well and It was. Okay. It was. I went to parochial schools uh -huh. for uh, K through twelve. And well actually first through twelve and um, and then went on to uh, actually to private schools for undergraduate and college as well. Where did you do your undergraduate work at? At Stanford University in okay. Palo Alto. Okay. And um, were, when you were in high school, any particular clubs or activities that you were involved in, and what about athletics? Oh, there were way too many activities, um, lots of them. N Title IX hadn't happened yet when I was in high school, and uh, so very few women were in sports. I was actually a, a cheerleader. Uh, that was kind of the sport most open to women. And um, I... Uh, but I, I was in a lot of activities, including drama and debate. And very good. Things like that. That's very nice. Um, uh, when, then you went to Stanford. Did you live on campus? Tell us about campus life when you, were, you went to Stanford for your undergraduate. I um, lived on campus all um, the whole time I was there, mm -hmm. and except for my overseas experiences. I had two overseas experiences, uh, and that was just great. What did, what did uh, prompt, what, what oversee, was that because, like a study abroad or? One was, okay. one was in Italy, in Florence, and that was the, at that time, the more conventional uh, experience where Stanford has a, a house in Florence, and so you're living with other Americans, but you have lots of experiences sure. outside the villa there for about six months, uh, two what? quarters. And then my other experience was a little different. It was doing research on my own in um, an Indian Pueblo in Oaxaca, Mexico. And uh, so I spent four months during a summer there uh, doing anthropology research. Okay. What was your major in? in uh, it was in English. English. Okay. Oh. And then tell us a little bit about then um, some of the professors or and what was the campus like in those days when you were there? Share some of your experiences in that. Well, the campus was, um, it started out quiet enough, but it soon got very um, uh, torn apart by the Vietnam War. And that was happening all across the country. And I think my parents felt that Stanford was a safer choice because it even then had a reputation for being more conservative. And uh, they said Berkeley was out of the question because things had already started up there. But it soon spread across the Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had um, a lot of folks on our campus that were uh, activists and getting the students more involved and questioning and our student body president Mary Joan Baez the folk singer and so we had a lot of um, peaceful candlelight processions through the campus protesting the war that sort of thing was a regular happening so I wasn't very sure that the college campus was a real happy place to be I was actually happier outside of it than on, <laughs> off campus on it. right yes <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. And then tell us after that, what, what after you graduated, what was the next? Well, I graduated thing? early. Uh -huh. First, because I saw I have, had enough units to graduate, and second, because I just thought, I just wanted to get out into the world and see what it was about, and there wasn't much keeping me on the campus. So I uh, then I, I had a summer job, but I graduated in December. So I had went and had several work experiences. I worked at a ski resort in Colorado. And uh, I had a few different jobs there because I, I really enjoyed the outdoors and all. And I had learned to rock climb in, at Stanford. That that was actually a very good thing. And so <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. And then I went on. I always wanted to see what New Orleans was like. And so I went and I got a little job there. Very nice. And uh, then I ended up in New York City for a position that I had won from a college competition writing competition for Mademoiselle magazine to be a guest editor in New York City. And uh, that was something that Joyce Carol Oates and Sylvia Plath had done before me, way before. And so I always aspired to, to do sure, that exactly. competition. So that was exciting. And uh, they sent us to Israel for our experience. They always, every college uh, uh, every year the guest editors were taken to a different country and so I went to Israel and wrote the travel story actually for the magazine about Israel and um, uh, and then I uh, it, that was the year of the moon landing and so I watched in 69. that in 69 I watched that on television and then I watched another public special about uh, cosmology and and I just I had that feeling of awakening about the space program, and I wanted to get more involved in that. So uh, that so that was after I left New York, and I had moved down to um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, for an education project for which I had won a grant with some other students. So I I went down to MIT, and I got a job there doing uh, space research at the same time I was doing the education project out of Cambridge, and um, that really convinced me that I wanted to go back into, sci into science. And when I say back, I mean back to my childhood love sure. for physics. And then, did, well then, uh, elaborate a little bit, so then you went to undergraduate school? I then, did, yeah. I did. I did a, a few things first. I was accepted to MIT as a graduate student at large, but uh, personal relationships took me back to California. And I, um, I was just sort of adrift for a little bit. I didn't know if I was really an English major or really going to be a science uh, person. So I got a job at the LA Times uh, with their, um, as a copy girl, and then I graduated to, soon to their news service. So I worked as an editor. And then I, um, I really decided I needed to go back to school. So I took some background classes for a year. Uh, in a nearby state college, uh, and then uh, got a job at Caltech doing research for one of the professors, who then turned out to be my thesis advisor Very once good. I got accepted to Caltech. Okay. So it was a, it was a long way around, <laughs> not recommended. Well, it was a challenge, and you had to sort of try yeah. different things, and then then once you had done that, then you sort of felt this is where I really want to move in that right. direction. Right, I had to have the confidence that I could do it and that's what I really wanted to yeah. do and I had nothing you know pushing me or encouraging right. me except for so myself and that's a little bit more awkward a position yeah. to be in. When you went to New York was that your first trip to New York at that time when you went to the Mademoiselle? I think, it, been... I think it was. I'm, I'm trying to remember if I had been there before. No I, I think that's it was That's a nice first... experience though and then to go to Israel for the the guest. I remember I remember those contests and the, and the guest because I used to subscribe to that magazine too so it was kind of a it was right. fun. We published the August edition of their mm -hmm. magazines called The College Issue. And so the other uh, women from different colleges in the right. U.S. were, it was great to meet them. They sure. were all talented in different ways. Right. And so that it was a great experience. The, the only downside was that we had to climb Masada in wool because even though it was <laughs> the middle of summer, you have to be prepared for their winter. fall, winter, you know, look. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we were in scarves and long wool suits climbing right. Masada. It was just <laughs> forget the calendar. This is what yeah, we're wearing but that's today. What, that's what models do. We learn. <laughs> right. so. Remember that. Keep that. <laughs> oh, now the search process. Uh, that's one of the responses to the board. Did, how did would they contact you, or did you make any comments on that? On the how you heard, or did you hear about the opening for, for this the president? Yes. Uh huh. 
Um, I, I don't even remember how far back I heard about the opening, probably around this time last year. Uh -huh. I, I think it was around November. And um, I, you know, I knew vaguely that Martin Jiski had announced his retirement, but I didn't know anything about the search sure. process. And then I was contacted by the company that the trustees hired, the search firm, to assist them. And I was contacted by them, and as w is my usual thing, I just ignored that, and I didn't respond to email. Then they started phoning, didn't respond to that. But finally, s somehow, I did end up talking to them after they had inquired a number of times, so I talked to them. And um, so the, they were persuasive to at least to have a, a conversation sure. with them. And I happened, they were based out of Dallas, and I happened to have a meeting in Dallas uh, with the company I worked for. And so I agreed to meet for coffee with the head of the search firm. And we talked about it. And, and then he talked with the board. And I didn't hear anything for a while. And then later on, I had an invitation. Uh, well, actually, it was a reverse invitation. They told me they'd like to come out, a few of the board and members, and talk with me. I think they were doing those kinds of interviews all around the country. So they flew to a local airport, and we had a breakfast at the airport, and we talked. And then they said I wasn't going to hear anything for a long time, and they were right. <laughs> so it was at least a month or six yeah. weeks. And then they invited me to interview uh, one of these airport interviews in Chicago sure. where you don't see who the other candidates are, but you know that the short list is pretty long at that point. So I did that. And then the next thing I heard, I was one of just a, a very few. And they invited me on campus. Very. For this was a, your first visit to the campus? A clandestine visit on April 11th. And I remember two things about that visit. One was it was very secretive. So even the hotel we stayed at, I, I, I would never be able to find it again, I'm sure. I think they had a false front, like one of those ghost towns when they have false fronts. And it was, wasn't really a Holiday Inn. It was a double tree or something else. Gotcha. So, and it wasn't, it wasn't very close to here, and neither was the dinner. And they, they told me not to dress like I was interviewing, to wear jeans or something so that people would think I was Happy just there Howell for Park that. Park is looking better all the time. Yeah, right, right. right. But of course, I didn't have a pair of jeans. That was a problem. But, and then, then it, uh, it snowed. And I thought my husband was just going to nix the whole thing, seeing snow in the middle of April you know, and slush and everything, and he was just groaning about how miserable it was. <laughs> so I thought, when did these students get a break? It's already the middle of April, and they're leaving in May, and it's right. still snowing here. Right. So, uh, so that was our first visit to campus. Yeah. Your, your comment about the contacts, I've interviewed some other people, and some same reaction, not for this particular, but openings, and they, they get turned off, and then people get persistent. So it seems to be that you have to kind of think it through, you know, when you, they you get do. a call. And which, because you're not sure, well, how did, how did you find my name or something of that sort? And uh, then sometimes somebody else will make a phone call. Right. So your experience has been shared by others that I've interviewed, too. Uh -huh. for various jobs that they've had over time. Well, also, I wasn't the usual candidate. I mean, you just have to look on the web page at what the former presidents sure. um, of sure. Purdue look like, and they're all uh, look different than I did. So I didn't have much of an expectation that it was going to go in my direction. And that was reinforced by heads of other search firms who were trying to recruit me to interview for their positions. And I said, well, you know, I just, I mean, there's only so much you can do because right. you want to be well prepared. Exactly. And, you, and I did have a current job, and I w really wasn't interested in sure. leaving there. I was very happy. And I said, no, pr Purdue's an unusual opportunity, so I'm willing to pursue this. And, you know, one or two of them just laughed at me. They said, oh, Purdue, they'll never hire a woman, France. Never. I mean, you know, get real. So. It, it was an interesting experience to stay I in the imagine. search under that kind of pressure. Yeah. And, you know, curiously, that kind of comment mostly came from women, not, not men.
Interesting. It was women. So Interesting. I yeah. thought that was Do they see? It appears that more of the searches today seem to be going with a search firm as a as a, an adjunct to the trustees or whatever as far as some of the openings. Does that seem to be what the pattern is? Oh, I, I think for certain positions, mm -hmm. definitely. Even for co a corporate as well as in yes. academia. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that the, that's, uh, good search firms really, they, they know what they're doing. They know how to preserve confidentiality. And right. there's so much uh, that can go wrong in a process and make a mess of it for everybody, right. including the, the university doesn't want to be embarrassed, That's right? right. Exactly. And they want the references thoroughly checked. Right. And you have to have a skill, especially in this more legalistic day and age, to ask appropriate questions, but still get to the information that, that you need to have. Right. Very good. Now, the first day on campus, which was nice, July 16th, and that you meet the community, that uh -huh. I, I was in the crowd, but it was just wonderful. It was really nice to, to do something on your first day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And it was a, and I, you got a you. very a huge turnout. Huge turnout. Yeah. And it was nice to announce that I had appointed an interim provost. I spent some time on that, of course, sure. on the phone talking with uh, right. over two dozen people about their choices and putting it all together like a jigsaw puzzle. Sure, exactly. So I felt confident that yeah. I was making a good choice and getting to do that kind of an announcement on the first day to make sure people were confident that we would have the provostial leadership in place and that it was somebody that they they knew and trusted. Right, exactly. That was important. Too. What was your reaction when you, when you stepped out on the stairs and saw all these people? It's like going to the theater and, and you're on stage or something. <laughs> It was very pleasant being down there looking at it. It was, uh, it was a very nice reaction. It, they, everybody was very gracious, very hospitable. Yeah, the whole thing is like a dream now, looking back at it. It, <laughs> it really was. But I just, I, fortunately, I have been on a stage. <laughs> so I know that you're Careful ultimately... Careful walking down the steps, right? Well, that was one thing. But another thing <laughs> is that you realize when you're playing a role and and what that role means to people. Uh, they expect you to right. walk and talk and look like the president exactly. of Purdue. Exactly, gotcha. <laughs> okay, and then your first commencement, um, and this is sort of a lead into, beginnings are exciting, everything is fresh and new, and this is for you, you know, beginnings. And your theme uh, for 2007 is listening and learning, and the desire to build on the momentum. And You've been engaged in that, haven't you, the listening yes. and learning, which is nice. Yes. You want to comment a little bit on that? Well, I thought that would be a good theme for the first 90 days. Um, I knew that the trustees wanted to get a strategic planning process going as soon as possible. Uh, but that's, that's very difficult to do right. when you don't know what the themes are, should be, right. and who the people should be that are involved and everything is very new to you. And so I thought I would ask a lot of questions about how people perceived their own role in leadership and moving the university forward and, and what its historical narrative had been. Uh, why did it get to this point and who were the major movers in that and then where did it need to go in the future. So I wanted to understand all that in order to get set out a place. planning process. Right. But I, I think that that was accomplished. Um, the um, all the invitations to speak notwithstanding. <laughs> Understand. Gotcha. Understand. Uh -huh. Well, I would, uh, Becca, I want, uh, one of the things that I would like to share with you is that this out of compliment to you, and we're very pleased. This is the first time that we've been able to interview a person at the beginning, such as yourself as the president, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. It's it's kind of an added thing. It's nice to, I've been pleased to have done Dr. Baring and Dr. Jeske, but it's sort of nice also to pick up and have it this way too. So I, I'm very appreciative that you were willing to do this, and I thank you. <laughs> um, our priority, highest priority is excellence in education for students. Student success and student support seems to be a major initiative. That that seems to, and you've made some comments, and yes. you've met with the students too, and oh, that's sure. our key thing that we're here for. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I think a, a distinguished student body that is uh, happy and successful and doing things that make a difference, uh, that gets um, it gets noticed. It gets um, it gets into the students themselves, and then they become successful alumni, and they 
give back in a variety of ways. And I think it, it ultimately just en enhances our reputation. And right. for us, reputation is so important. So I right. think it's a, it's a very necessary, essential way of building your reputation. Right, that's good. One of the other goals that was mentioned is multidisciplinary research among faculty. You're going to be, we're doing that now, but you're planning to increase on that? Focus. Yes, uh -huh. yes. We're we're, um, we're we're more at the starting gate. Mm -hmm. Just having left the starting gate, I guess is the way I'd put it. Mm -hmm. We have a, a lot to learn about. Uh, we want to do multidisciplinary collaborations, and we realize the value of it, and we realize that lots of places are doing it and sure. setting out a new frontiers. But we, um, it's a it's an art as much of as a science and we have to build the partnerships that help make that successful and we have to learn to communicate it and talk about it in a different way uh, so and be comfortable with it absolutely yeah. right absolutely a mm -hmm. uh, couple other things the diversity that, mm -hmm. that will be part of the strategic plan mm -hmm. uh, and also athletics mm -hmm. you uh, been at the games and things, and you do the flag very well. I've seen it. That was great. <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> well, the the real flag waver was Neil Armstrong right. at our homecoming game. Yeah. When he waved the flag, when we were um, you know, we were challenged out there on the football team, I think he turned the whole game around. So that's <laughs> right. that's the way to wave a flag. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, strategic plan, I know you're, uh, you're going to develop some plans for inputs of working groups and this is what you're working on at the moment and get the working groups going on the strategic right. plan mm -hmm. and uh, that will be a challenge. I, uh, I think it's going to be a fun challenge. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in, in this kind of position you have to enjoy process as much as outcomes. Um, otherwise you get too driven towards the outcomes and you want them to happen too fast and you don't secure them in a way that's lasting. So I, I think having a, a rewarding, enjoyable uh, process that involves a lot of people, gets a whole lot of new ideas on the table, and that makes some um, you know, interesting, has some interesting results to it is is very exciting, the, the possibilities that are inherent in that approach. So I'm really as excited about this year and the process of engaging the campus in the strategic plan as I am about what we will eventually, you know, Bring have to the as table a result. As the final thing. Right. right. Yeah. Um, fundraising. You're going to, uh, one thing I read, the short and long term, it's a mini campaign. Is this what you're sort of thinking about or well? Uh, well, it was pointed out to me that 1.7 billion dollars was a lot of money to raise in this uh, the campaign that just ended sure. and that we uh, probably have worn out a lot of people and and there are a lot of pledges on the table of course sure. you know, that have to be fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, there's There are always new people that want to be sought out and uh, sought after and can contribute, uh, but to launch a major campaign on the tail of, uh, the one of another one right. is is something that's not commonly done. So we thought that our approach would be uh, clearly any distinguished university has to be co constantly raising money to do all the things that state support just can't do. As essential as the state support is, it's very you know limited in right. uh, in its uh, capacity. So so to become to go to the next level as we want to do and be distinguished in research and teaching engagement, then we're we're going to have to continue to seek private support. So I thought maybe a more palatable idea would be to have. Um, a series of mini campaigns, which in the aggregate would be like a major campaign right. when you add them all up, but they'll be more focused, more strategic around goals that we uh, clearly enunciate and, sure. um, and put a lot of energy behind. And the, so the first one we're going to be doing is really focused around around students. Uh, it's, it's very, very clear to me when I look at our data on recruiting students that we need to provide a lot more scholarship money. Right. Tuition has risen everywhere across the country and there are very good reasons for that. I think you do get the um, return on the investment in the tuition. There's no question about that. Right. Your dollars are wisely invent, uh, invested. Um, and, and, but, but where do you get them if you're a family that has um, right. 
limited means or and or have multiple children that you want to get through college more or less simultaneously. So we need to, to be able to help students find the way to meet the, the high cost of college, whether they're in state or out of state. Right. And so we have set about doing that in the last few weeks and we have a real strategic plan. We've already started that for this year's group of admittees and we'll be m further expanding that as our capacity increases sure. as we raise more money. Yeah, that's very good. One of the things that uh, uh, put on the topics is that Purdue and the University of California, that, which is land grant, but the the system is different, the California versus the Indiana system of higher education. Could you comment on that, How the, what the differences would be? Uh, well, they're, they're enormously different. Uh, I think the, the similarity is that um, land-grant uh, universities were designated, of course, in the late 1800s, and Purdue is the one for Indiana. And I was at a uh, previous such institution in the UC system. It only started in the 50s, but um, but it started with the land grant heritage that mm. was given to UC Berkeley, and we were first at UC Riverside an arm of Berkeley, their agricultural extension station in the uh, in Southern California, and so with them we became our own campus, and we kept, of course, that land grant imprint and strong agricultural roots and service and extension program. So I very much understand that land grant mm -hmm. tradition coming here. But when you look at it from a system, a higher education system perspective, uh, the University of California is unique as is the system in Indiana uh, unique and very different from right. each other. Sure. Um, the universe, uh, California has only one research system, the University of California system with 10 campuses and they're all research universities. And um, they all have the same requirement of students that they be in the top 12 and half percent of uh, their high school uh, class in order to be admitted. overall to be admitted to any campus in the UC system. Uh, the, in Indiana, you have two research systems, the Purdue system and the IU system. And, um, and they've been given at the outset different areas to as their purview to be more distinguished in. So you'll find that we have different professional schools, different sure. disciplines that we're distinguishing. So that's unusual. In the University of California, almost every campus has the same array of things. Okay. Same um, schools. Or very similar. Right. Very similar. So. Okay, I see that. Now, uh, okay. Next thing I want to ask is about the visit to the White House. Oh. Yeah, yes. And I want. Okay. In July 2007, your visit to the White House for Dr. Getty's National Medal of Technology. That was an uh, exciting moment for Dr. Geddes, and of course I was filled with pride as president of Purdue. It's I've always only great. been here a short time. Right. <laughs> and to see, I, I was hoping we'd have that happen every week. With somebody on our faculty would be invited to the White House. <laughs> what, uh, what sort of, how would the event go when uh, you, you flew there in the plane? But tell us just a little bit mm. about going there and whatever, uh, well, for, how they had it set up. Well, uh, Dr. Geddes was delighted, of course, to be honored in that way. They had the other National Medal of Technology winners there at sure. the White House. And they also had the National Medal of Science winners. And what I thought was particularly nice for Purdue is that one of those was uh, an alumna, Rita Colwell, right. who was the previous director of the National Science Foundation. So we really had two winners there, one for technology and one for science. And the, um, the president uh, himself seemed very uh, enamored of Dr. Geddes. Uh, he, uh, President Bush made some remarks to start the whole sure. event off with all of, um, uh, an incredible array of cabinet secretaries there, including Condoleezza Rice and, and many others. And uh, he only mentioned one of the laureates by name, and that was Dr. Geddes as an example. So we thought that was pretty special. I think it's because we have some people in the White House who are also Purdue alums. <laughs> and, we don't uh, give away those secrets. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but uh, he, and then Dr. Geddes is so charming, and he has all these wonderful stories. And so when he got up there to get his medal, and the president puts it around his neck, 
he whispered something to him, which got a chuckle from the president, and he told him this, his famous story about the turtle on the fence <laughs> post. And so uh, the, the whole event was very nice. Then they had a reception, and uh, the, the cabinet secretary stayed there, and I made sure that I got somebody to take a picture of Dr. Geddes with Dr. Rice, and so that was very nice uh, as well. And uh, Did you get a chance to, to speak with, uh, with the president? Uh, no, oh. myself, no, okay. no. He came in there and did the ceremony, and so he had a little time on the stage with, with each of the winners, and then they ushered the president out. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And then from there, there was uh, something else at the Commerce Department? Yes, oh. yes. The Commerce Department, who was a major sponsor of the Technology Award, had a, uh, a ceremony there. That was very nice yes. for all of the lawyers. So it was kind of a nice, a very good occasion. Oh, yeah. It was absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Yes. The uh, President's Leadership Class, you're going to continue that on. And are you yes. going to keep it in the same vein, or do you have some changes? And it's nice that this year one of the science bound students uh -huh. is a member. That's right. And that right. was a program that uh, has That's been in, right. that Dr. Jesse got started. That's right, yes. It's a very, very good program. They've had a great group of speakers. Um, they meet, as you know, once a week. And uh, the students are just wonderful and they're all they ask a lot of questions they're a great resource for me for example we had a very interesting conversation last night at dinner with one of the old masters all of the old masters are on campus this week right and we talked about what attracted the students to Purdue and what um, differences in our admissions processes from other campuses and some of the materials they got and the reasons they made their choice and I just thought all that information is very, very helpful in going forward. And what we should do is listen a lot more to the students because they can tell us why students also make the decision maybe not to come. Right. And so we can benefit from their right. insights. Yeah. Have, yeah, um, the students, you have about 19 this year, don't you? Mm -hmm. And there was, uh, did you get to meet, they've had the class, did uh, ones that have taken the class before, have you met any of those at all or not, or just the new class? Um, just the new class, it's a, individual people who have been through that program who are now in leadership capacities, uh -huh. like student trustees sure. and all, they uh, always tell me about that experience. So as I meet students on campus, they will tell me that they've been through that yeah. program. It's a, it's a good, good starter for that. Mm -hmm. And you've done some visitation, you went to the regional campuses. Yes, several times each campus. Okay, enjoyed and those visits. Yes, and, and then you uh, and you did mention that you you had a chance to meet the governor. Yes, was he uh -huh. here or did you did you meet him in Indianapolis? Both. Oh, I I've met him there for a more or less private with sure. a few of his senior officials, uh, a meeting, and um, then he was on campus uh, to speak at our Healthy Purdue oh. initiative. Right. And then last week, uh, I was with him again with a small group of presidents of uh, Indiana universities to talk about higher education issues. And tomorrow, I'll be having lunch with him. Uh, he is honoring our uh, Dr. Phil Nelson, who won the World Food Prize, which is another very distinguished yes. award. And in fact, he said that the legislature wants to do something special in honor of Dr. Geddes. I'm not sure it's what it will be. But um, so I, I've nice. had several opportunities. I, um, that would be very I, nice. Yes, yes, I, right. I, I'm impressed that the governor and uh, his office and uh, and our legislators are very keen on doing more uh, with and for higher education. Yes, that's very really good. Westwood, have you made some changes out there and? Uh uh, were there many changes, and, and you're all moved in now out there? Well, all the walls are still standing, and it's got the <laughs> same roof over its head. Uh, I, I think that they, uh, whenever presidents transition, it's an opportunity for facilities to go in there and do some needed work. Right. So there, I guess there was a heating and cooling system problem that they wanted to overhaul. And then uh, the, the events coordinator for Westwood uh, with the Jiskies had recommended several improvements to the whole catering operation because, as you know, uh, there's almost a couple of hundred catering uh, events a year. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so it's used uh, a lot to raise more friends for the university. 
and, and celebrate all kinds of things. And so, um, so we made uh, those, by we I mean Purdue University and facilities, physical plant made those improvements. And then uh, we took the opportunity to do some painting and new carpet and reveal some of the, there's some beautiful wood underneath the uh, former carpet and just opening that up a little bit mm -hmm. and letting that shine through. So it, it, you know, it looks different cosmetically, but really the real changes you can't see because they're in the infrastructure. They're behind the walls <laughs> right. and under the floor. Oh, is the house about the same size as the one you had in Riverside, or is it? Uh, well, it's such a different uh, shape. That's an interesting question. I would say that the public space is larger and the private space is smaller. That's how to summarize it. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. What about land around? Was there a lot of land oh, around? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, well, they're probably uh, very similar because our house in Riverside, the Chancellor's residence, backed onto part of the agricultural experiment station. So we had a huge citrus grove. Oh. And it had avocado and lots of different kinds of citrus, exotics, uh, plants, and all. And uh, running sideways to it was the university's botanical garden. Mm. And that was a, a large acreage. And so we had all of that that we could enjoy from a back door sort of sense Very and walk nice. through it and walk our dog through it. So it had a, a I, compare it to sort of old world California when the first stage coaches rolled through sure. and you, you know, you look through and you saw groves and well, and, you know, not the first stage coaches, but you know how California developed in its Over early time, days. Right, Over exactly. time, right, exactly. Had that smell of orange blossoms in the air. So Super. It was lovely. <laughs> yeah. oh. But Westwood, we just love. It's, a, it's very different. It's also very botanical. Did you have a large, that driveway going up is always kind of nice. And the yes. house in Riverside did have a... No, oh, it had a very short driveway. Short driveway. Yes. So now you could swing around. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh, and congratulations. You got uh, the October Girl Scouts Award from Indiana. That's that's very nice. How did, yes. Were you surprised when they touched base with you on that? Uh, I was. I, I think that's actually, very nice. Yes, it is. I actually have, this is my third honor from Girl Scouts. I was honored by Girl Scouts in Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, where I was previously. Uh, I, I attribute it to my having been a brownie and a Girl Scout. And um, so I, I think they never forget you. So I'm pleased to <laughs> you be honored that, that way. You carries with uh -huh. you then, right? Yes. I just wish I had saved that scarf with uh, all, all those, the things that the all those badges that I worked so hard on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then you received, of course, the NASA Highest Honor and Distinguished Service Medal, and the 2000 Kilby Laureate for contribution to society through science, technology, innovation invention and education. Tell us a little bit about that particular one for the researchers that Kilby won that you got. Yes, it, it's an award named after Jack St. Clair Kilby who is um, uh, the inventor of the microchip and uh, he he actually passed away right after I was in the 10th group of laureates, Kilby laureates, and then he passed away so soon after that. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for that, mm -hmm. um, and um, it, so this this award, uh, based out of Dallas, Texas, is uh, just uh, awards innovation in um, technology and higher education. And I was just very, very pleased to be so honored. It was a very, very nice award in the Texas State House, and. Um, Nice award. Nice, nice, nice event. award. The whole idea of the Kilby Foundation is to give back to students and to encourage them with role models, and that's a role that, um, you know, being kind of a former nerdly student, I never, I, I never, I didn't appreciate for a long time the importance of role models. But then I realized at some point that if if I had had role models in science who had looked like me, I might have set out on that course mm -hmm. at a much earlier stage. It would have been easier for me and easier for me to talk with my parents and for them to see it too. So I, um, I, I, I think the, the whole idea of mentorship and role models is, is incredibly mm -hmm. important. So I was pleased to be part of that yeah, program. that's good. And then your family, now you, you had a husband and you got some hobbies. You were mentioned that, I guess, running and hiking. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, skiing too, as well. Yeah, we like to to ski, especially cross country skiing. I'll I'll do a downhill ski, but uh, 
uh, it's, uh, it's, it's more terrifying these days it's if there are snowboarders on the <laughs> slopes. Uh, you know, you're always worried about being hit. And, uh, I, but uh, but cross-country skiing, my husband and I did a lot of that when we, uh, we first met and were uh, raising a young family. I used to ski with one of my kids in my backpack and, you know, and snow all over their faces and that sort of thing. But it's just nice to be out in the wilderness and have the yeah. snow gently falling. And, and I understand you have two children. and We have two children, okay. yes. My husband and I met climbing, and we really, really enjoyed that sport for a long time. Do you still do uh, it? No, uh, because our kids didn't like it. We tried to... Um, you know, get get them up on ropes and whatnot, up some climbs and in Yosemite, and I think we just terrified them. They absolutely hated it, and we finally decided this was no fun. And uh, so instead so we, of that, we just went to their soccer matches and their cross-country meets. That, that sounds was, all right. They enjoyed that more. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, the, how do you want your stewardship to be remembered at the end of your presidency? Care to comment on that? Uh, as you look, as you look ahead. Well, I could already comment on it in a very general sure. sense. I, 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 think I would treat the question as that, but as right. I said earlier, starting something and then being able to, when you're finished your term of presidency, do another interview. Right, right. Um, I, I, in, in a general sense, I want to look back and know that I added value and that I um, brought some new awarenesses and appreciation to um, Purdue, and that I raised it one brick higher. Right. Good. Sounds good. How about an outstanding event in your life? Have you got one of those you'd like to share with us? Well, there are a or lot. Or there could of, be more. Uh, there's, there's a lot of outstanding events. Uh, I, I wouldn't even know where, where to start. I thought getting my Ph.D. was a pretty outstanding event because, um, because it was a very personal struggle that I, I had to kind of hide out from a lot of folks who just thought, why are you starting all over again? And um, You had to keep motivated, keep moving. That's right. And it was a very inner kind of motivation that it was something I loved and I just had to just kind of plug away at it. And it was, also, it was very, it was difficult, you know, and I was one of two women in my uh, class at Caltech my, in graduate school in physics and um, I, it was just you know and studying all, all oh, that it, right. was, it was just really it was really a challenge and to keep imagining myself as being an astrophysicist at the end of it all when I had so many people wondering what what are you doing you know didn't we didn't we pay for your Stanford education? <laughs> this you is know? my, my challenge. Shouldn't you be writing books or magazine articles? This is my challenge, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that was very special. Uh, of course, meeting my husband was a really special moment, especially since we were a thousand feet off the ground when we met. And so was it, was it at, a, at an event? We were, we were just rock climbing, and so we swung over to say One of those clubs or saw rock climbing yes, clubs? Yes, right, exactly. Yeah. A club. And, uh, so and and just so many experiences with our with our children and all too just been they all come wonderful. together yeah. yes uh, anything any questions that you'd like to ask or any in closing that you can, want to make a comment on I'll put the ball to you um, Court. thank you I I just just about every day feel that this is a very very special position to be in as uh, president of Purdue. And I'm very grateful to the people who thought that I could do it for taking that risk um, because I do look like an, a new face uh, at the leadership helm of Purdue. And I, I really ap appreciate that. I don't ever take it for granted. I think that there's tremendous amount of opportunity here. People have been just fabulous to me and to my husband, our family. and I just always hope to do the best I can by mm -hmm. Purdue and um, to make it someday as proud of me as I am of it. Sounds good. I thank you very much, President Corda. Thank you on behalf. I uh, really appreciate that. That concludes it.